Honeywell is front and center when it comes to COVID response efforts worldwide. And I think some people might not even realize that your technology touches everything from N95 masks to airlines, to event spaces, universities, offices. Where is Honeywell playing the most critical role in the pandemic chain, if you will? Well, it, it, thank you very much. And thank you, Emily, for having me on your show. Um, it really changed over time. So initially when we first entered the pandemic, was really all about getting the N95 masks as quickly as we possibly could. And we really played a front and center role as early as March and into April and quickly expanded our capacity. And obviously that was sort of the priority one. But that also quickly shifted because some of the other things that we do is we make uh, some of the sensors for the ventilators. So we had a big backlog of that instantly in April. Uh, we actually made our own ventilator as well for emergency use. So initial focus was how do we respond to this crisis that we're in very, very quickly. But now our focus is much more on how do we get people back to their workplace, back to flying again, back to having fun again, back to going to stadiums again. And that, that's really a complete shift. So now we're working with a lot of airlines, a lot of the teams in the NFL and the NCAA to get uh, their stadiums ready, working a lot of building owners, how to get their employees back in a safe manner. And we've a different user experience, both for the occupants as well as the owners. So it's, we've really been all over the board from kind of immediate response to the crisis to now to, per, to preparing to emerge from it and returning to a state of near normal. You opened up factories in Arizona and Rhode Island to make N95 masks. President Trump even visited one of those facilities back in May, though he wasn't seen wearing a mask um, in the video or photos at the time. How closely are you still working with the White House on PPE in particular? You know, we've had a very good partnership with the White House to help them out any way we can. You know, we quickly opened up the facilities, as you mentioned, Rhode Island and, and Phoenix. And, uh, you know, we're trying to help out any way we can. We're helping them also with some surgical masks. That was some of the latest discussions that we had and uh, open up some new capacity to make those. But we're continue to have discussions and try to help the country in any way that we possibly can. There's still a huge amount of near-term uncertainty. Nobody knows exactly what the future looks like, potentially even long-term. What do you make of the president's evolution on masks, given that initial interaction you had with him? Yeah, and I, I think the president um, is supportive of masks. The, that based on uh, the data that I've seen, they uh, they help to limit the spread. We're certainly encouraged by that, particularly being N95 makers. You know, we certainly uh, practice that. I mean, we have some of our staff working in offices. Most are not, particularly in North America yet. Uh, but we certainly uh, encourage and require the use of masks wherever we are in, in an office environment. You're also in touch with airline CEOs regularly. What is your role in trying to get passengers back on flights safely if they need to fly? But this is all about passenger comfort, uh, passenger safety, and, uh, and I think the airlines have done a terrific job uh, in that respect. I mean, we're helping them with sterilization of some of the air. You may have seen some of the kind of robot-like uh, devices that really roam the aisles with uh, ultraviolet light, which actually help sterilize the cabins and can do so in a matter of minutes between, in between flights. We're also working on some solutions to have cleaner air within the aircraft itself. Uh, with some of our technologies, which are a little bit longer term in nature, but also very basic things such as PP and E kits for the passengers themselves. So we have sort of a full range of solutions from the very sophisticated and technical to some very basic things such as wearing masks. Now, many traditional industrial companies are turning to software and, and Honeywell is one of those. Why is this shift happening? And you know, what are the opportunities specifically that you see for Honeywell? The basic foundational element throughout all our businesses is controls. I mean, whether we control aircraft, control buildings, control industrial plants, and you control things through hardware and software. So software has always been part of the fiber of who we are as Honeywell. As a matter of fact, we have more software engineers than any other type of engineers on our staff today. And we have no, way north of 20,000. 
So the transition to using data, because when you control something, you're obviously connected to everything, and using it in a different manner than to control the process is a natural evolution of the company. And that's why we form our Honeywell Connected Enterprise, our Forge uh, IT stack, and building out our connected solutions. Right, you're talking about the cloud there. In that case, how much revenue, let's say, would you expect to drive Honeywell's sales? How, how much would software drive that revenue in five years? Right. So right now we have you know, $4 billion business and software. Some of that is embedded, some of it is independent. You know, we expect that double digit growth rate for the, our software business. We've been able to achieve that. We've actually done you know, much more than 10%. Um, and, uh, and that's the expected growth rate. We hope to augment that through some bolt-on acquisitions as well. So it's gonna become a much more meaningful part of our portfolio going forward. What kind of acquisitions are you, or would you consider? Anything outside of your core business like aerospace, energy buildings, automation? Well, obviously we, we love the platforms that we're in. So we always look for adjacencies and bolt-ons, which sort of says, you know, it's you know, close adjacencies. Um, you know, we, we look for software assets, but not just software assets. We think that with the strength of the balance sheet that we have today, uh, this is going to be a bit more friendly M&A environment, particularly the A part of it. Um, so we're going to be active, and we're going to be very active in the second half of this year and hope to augment our businesses, certainly the digital businesses, but potentially some others as well. 